That's, uh, that's really uh, such a generous introduction. I, um, I'm just so honored and thrilled to be here. I consider it a, just a great gift from all of you to me, and so I hope uh, you'll accept my small gift of this lecture. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is the subject of basic research in computing. And of course, uh, that initially begs the question, what is basic research? And it's a little bit embarrassing, but it's actually hard to answer that question. Uh, and it's a question that's been hard to answer, actually, for a very long time. Uh, around um, uh, 80 years ago, there was the famous uh, rocket scientist, uh, Werner von Braun. And later in his career, he once stated that research is what I do when I don't know what I'm doing. And uh, I think he was inspired by Albert Einstein, uh, who said something very similar, I think, a little bit earlier, which was uh, the line, if I knew what I was doing, it wouldn't be research. And so uh, let, allow me, please, uh, to put myself in the company of Albert Einstein and Werner von Braun and admit that oftentimes I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, and that's, uh, in fact, part of what I'm going to talk about today. One of the exciting things about research in computer science is that we oftentimes set out to do one thing, set out to solve one problem, and perhaps we solve it, uh, perhaps we don't, but surprisingly often, the results of our research in computing produce surprising results. And that idea of surprise, or sometimes referred to as serendipity, the feeling that uh, somehow we just became lucky in the application of an idea or in the usefulness of some result, that concept is something that I find just completely intoxicating and valuable in our field of computing research. So what I'd like to do today is go through three examples uh, drawn from the experience of Microsoft research of how basic research leads to surprises uh, in innovations in technology. Now, before I do that, um, I, uh, uh, I am very honored here uh, to be in front of so many very good students. And so, uh, I was a professor for a very long time, and so let me start this lecture with a small test. And so I'm going to ask all of you to participate in this test. And what I will do is I will show you a picture of some multicolored dots, and I will give you three seconds to complete the problem. And what is the problem? I want you to look at the picture and tell me, within three seconds, how many green dots there are. Everybody ready? OK, here we go. Three, two, one. OK, how many blue dots? Anyone? <laughs> uh, if, it, if, uh, if it's any comfort to you, um, when I lecture to students in the United States and in Europe, uh, they don't pass the test either, so it's OK. Now, uh, of course, it's a silly test. It's a trick. Um, but there's a point here. For example, in Microsoft Research, we oftentimes work with product groups. And these product groups are extremely disciplined. They are in, in just incredibly focused on understanding the customer's needs, on defining a product and a user experience, on writing down a plan very carefully, and then executing that, plane, that plan almost with military efficiency. And so what you were all doing when you were trying to count the green dots is you were also executing a task almost with military efficiency. You were very focused, because you're all very good students, on completing the task of counting the green dots. So one thing about research is that research is more about an exploratory search for truth and understanding, sometimes a search for beauty. And so in research, yes, we want to know how many green dots there are, but we also have other curiosities. We want to know, are there other colors? Are there other shapes? How many other colors and how many other shapes? How many blue dots? And it's in those other questions that we oftentimes find surprising innovations. And it's in those surprising innovations that oftentimes, in fact, more often than not, we get the real value of research. 
So let me try to go right into some concrete examples. So uh, the first example I want to uh, talk about has to do with what's called audio processing. And so this is a scene from the New York Stock Exchange. And if you look carefully at the picture, you just see pandemonium. Lots of noise, people shouting, waving at each other. And a trader who's recording trades on the floor is looking at this scene and is listening to each person's voice for important trade information and is noting this down, sometimes in a notebook, sometimes in a tablet computer. What's amazing is that we, as human beings, with our audio array of two ears, are, we are able to focus our hearing, even in a noisy environment, on a single person's voice in a crowded room like this. And so one question is, can we have computing systems with similar kinds of capabilities? And this is a problem that, of course, many people have worked on. Maybe some of you have worked on. And so the problem is as follows. Someone is speaking to us. And then we have a microphone, and we want to hear that person's voice using this microphone. And of course, we have the complications that that person might be in a crowded room with many people talking. And so somehow we have to focus on that one person. And in fact, it might not just be people talking, but there might be many sources of noise and sound and music all throughout the room. And so the question is, can we have a system with a microphone that's able to hear that one person's voice that we're interested in? Now, um, as many of you know, uh, with human hearing, we have two ears. That makes an audio array. And so we could also imagine having an audio array uh, on uh, our machine, and then building an audio pipeline that gives us the audio output of the person's voice that we're interested in, as well as the direction information of where that person is speaking from. And this is uh, a classic problem in signal processing and in computer science. Now, in Microsoft Research, uh, as long as uh, more than 10 years ago, uh, we have been engaged in research on exactly this type of problem. And we're very proud of the fact that we've developed technologies, uh, such as uh, the MVDR adaptive beamformer, that is actually able to do sound processing of an audio array in order to have this kind of focus. And this is an example of what I call basic blue sky research. We're trying to solve a problem, trying to achieve some understanding about the properties of sound and about the properties of adaptive beamforming, and understand and write down the theoretical properties of this. Now, at some point, one wants to move past the theory and achieve uh, an actual working system. And so at Microsoft Research, uh, we, uh, of course, engage in that type of work as well. And so what you see pictured here is a prototype of a nine microphone uh, audio array system uh, that was used extensively in a number of experiments to try to implement and make real this concept of an MVDR adaptive beamformer. And so this nine microphone array uh, was attached to a machine, a computer with an audio pipeline that would give audio output and direction information. And just to give you an idea of how well it works, um, uh, let me play two audio files. The first audio file that you'll hear is the sound of several people talking in a noisy room. Uh, and this sound was captured uh, with a single microphone, one of these microphones. So listen very carefully. I, uh, I think we need a little more volume. There we go. And so I don't know if anyone could hear, but in fact, there was a man talking amongst all, in, in all that noise. And you hear the problem that computers tend to have uh, in a crowded room, a room like this, or even in a living room where you're having a party with a bunch of friends, a computer has a very hard time hearing uh, a, a person trying to give commands to that computer. And so now with this device and with an MVDR adaptive beamformer, that very same audio source comes out sounding like this. Xbox Shuffle. Xbox Dashboard. Xbox Go Back. Xbox Exo. 
And so now you can start to see the same kind of ability to focus the hearing of an audio array attached to a computer, very similar to what a human can do in a crowded room. And this ends up being extremely important in a number of applications, such as uh, video and audio conferencing systems. Now, uh, I call this a type of research that's directed to disruptive innovation or disruptive technology. We take some basic research ideas, oftentimes very theoretical ideas, and actually try to reduce it to practice, try to build a device that actually realizes the theoretical principles in a way that one can imagine could be practical. And so the, the going from basic research to disruptive technology ends up being a very important step uh, in the whole path or pipeline to innovation. Now, one thing uh, I should say about Microsoft Research is that, uh, and it's something I'm very proud of at MSR, is that we publish openly most of what we do, almost everything that we do. And in fact, here is a picture of a research paper uh, that uh, two of our researchers, Ivan Tashev and Alex Acero, along with their uh, intern uh, at the time, uh, Nilesh Madhir, uh, wrote uh, on uh, that prototype system. And this is important because by engaging with the external community, uh, by engaging with universities, we can tap into the best minds in the world, we can test our ideas to make sure that they're solid, and also influence the direction of the field into directions that are hopefully beneficial to Microsoft's long-term future. Now, uh, one reason also to show you this paper is that this paper uh, was submitted. Incidentally, I should n uh, also mention before I go to the next step that Alex Acero is actually here in the audience. Uh, and I want to mention that specifically, that he's here. In fact, he's sitting right there. Um, because this paper, uh, while it was submitted for publication, uh, was rejected. And I actually took the time to read the paper and, uh, and the uh, referees' reports. And the referees' reports were very unkind uh, to this paper. And so just to give you some excerpts, uh, one reviewer said that the, that the solution doesn't solve the problem at all. Uh, there's no real uh, stereo uh, echo cancellation. There's no improvements. And the last review report, which I thought was uh, the most uh, damaging, was uh, the reviewer thought that there were serious drawbacks for realistic scenarios. And these are actually comments from the reviewers. And so this is something else on the path to disruptions and the path to real advances in technology that oftentimes it's hard for the scientific community to really understand and come to grips with, with something that's very new. Of course, this technology is a technology that has been incorporated into the microphone array in the Xbox Connect. And so another aspect of the pipeline from basic research to disruptive technology is that there can come a point when as researchers, we engage in what I call mission-focused research. Research that is in partnership, in this case, with the Microsoft product team, where we work in close collaboration, close partnership, in order to bring a brand new disruptive technology to market. And this type of mission-focused research is, for many of our researchers, one of the holy grails of being at Microsoft and at Microsoft Research. The idea that we can use the fact that Microsoft has literally hundreds of millions of customers as a very, as Eric Horvitz, my good colleague, would say, as a long lever uh, to really uh, get the most out of our uh, uh, research efforts. And so despite the fact that the paper was rejected, uh, what we see here, in fact, we can see in this rejection that there's a very thin line between a visionary product concept and science fiction. The reviewers of our paper felt that what we had proposed was actually science fiction, not science fact. And in fact, oftentimes researchers try to stay in a very safe zone, staying within the well-known technology envelopes. And so when you move from basic research to disruptive research to mission-focused research, there's the potential for magic to happen. The magic that happens when a visionary product concept and visionary product developers work hand-in-hand -hand with world-class researchers. 
You can take researchers out of the comfort zone. You can add technical grounding to the product developers and make something really remarkable happen. And that's, in a nutshell, I think, uh, one of the lessons that we see from the development of the Xbox and the Kinect device. And so to summarize this, we see a pipeline, an innovation pipeline, where we go from basic research to an attempt to disrupt and do something for the first time, to mission-focused research, to actually bring something in collaboration with product teams uh, to market, and then after that, continuous and sustaining improvements to keep adding on, keep building on the successes that we have. And that sequence is uh, an innovation pipeline. And that innovation pipeline is something that we work very hard to make sure we keep very full. All four stage of this, uh, stages of this pipeline, uh, we s strive in our research uh, to always have good things happening. In fact, within the lab, we think very hard about the investments uh, that we make. And so in this graph, if we imagine this graph is the graph of all research investments, where on the x-axis, we go from very short-term research and, uh, projects, and as we go out along the x-axis, we get into longer and longer-term research. And on the y-axis, we have choices of problems, where we have what I call reactive problems, problems that are given to us by product teams, by society at large, by our academic collaborators. And as we go up the y-axis, we get to research problems that are more open-ended, just the open-ended search for truth and understanding. Within this whole space, we see the pipeline uh, fills the four quadrants of the space, where we have blue sky research in the upper right quadrant, mission-focused research in the lower left quadrant, sustaining research in the lower right, and in the upper left, this very interesting quadrant of uh, disruptive research. And so for me, it's, as a manager of a lab, it's incredibly important to make sure that we have very good activities and very good people operating in all four quadrants. And this, in fact, is a management principle uh, for uh, Microsoft research in, uh, uh, in the last couple of years. And so uh, this quadrant model is something that we'll see uh, a couple more times in this talk. All right. There's another point about the quadrants and that is a point about diversity. Sometimes when you talk to people, uh, maybe they're businessmen, uh, perhaps uh, they're uh, writers uh, in, uh, in various aspects of technology, uh, sometimes they are financial uh, people, economists, uh, there's a tendency to think of research as being only mission-focused or only blue sky, but in fact, as you see in the innovation pipeline and in the quadrants, there's wonderful diversity in computing research. And in that diversity, if we embrace it properly, we get this innovation pipeline. If we can get all four quadrants filled with very good activities, uh, we can really go uh, and hope to strive uh, towards uh, a really great uh, uh, feedback loop that keeps new innovations coming over and over again. All right. So that's the first example. Now let me give a second example. And I chose this second example um, uh, uh, looking at uh, Rick Rashid's uh, talk uh, keynote from this morning uh, where he talked about uh, program synthesis. And that's another area uh, that has some wonderful surprises. And so uh, let's start from the very beginning on this. Now in this research area, we start from the problem of program verification. Now, what is program verification? Well, the problem is we take some code and we want to apply algorithms for program verification. And those program verification algorithms are supposed to inspect the code and answer just a very simple question. And that question is, if we were to run this program, if we were to execute this code, can something bad happen? And as a practical matter, to help programmers, uh, it's also useful to extend the program verification paradigm so that uh, if something bad can happen, please generate some examples that uh, illustrate or exhibit the, the bad behavior, the bug. 
And that's useful because that way programmers can use those input outputs to chase down the exact nature of the bug and fix the problem. Now, program verification is a very old research area in computer science. It's a very important one. Uh, Jeanette Wing um, uh, alluded to it in the first part of her talk. Um, and it's something that Microsoft and Microsoft Research invests in very heavily because uh, we write very large amounts of software. And it's very important for us to know that the software is reliable and secure. We, again, conduct very basic research in this area. And in fact, recently, uh, two years ago, there's a very important paper that we published in Popol, uh, 2010, uh, on the idea of compositional may-must program analysis. And so I know quite a few of you study software engineering and uh, software program analysis program verification. Uh, and this paper is really fundamental in a lot of the tools that Microsoft uses today in really analyzing uh, our software and making sure that the software is as free as we can make it of uh, certain types of bugs, particularly security bugs in data parsers. And so this type of technology, even though it is oftentimes very theoretical, is also very practical for us. And in fact, from that basic research, the type of research that you would read about in that paper in Popple 2010, we also take the next step and try to do something disruptive. So we again go from basic research and take the next step in the innovation pipeline to disruptive technology. And one of the disruptive technologies is a system called Sage, which runs on a very large computing system uh, that's pictured above there. And that system called Sage does testing using program verification and analysis technologies, and in particular using compositional may-must analysis and automatic theorem proving to find security bugs in data parsers in some of our most important software products. And in fact, today, Sage finds more high-priority security bugs in those software products than any other testing technology used at Microsoft today. And so that's, again, for us, highly disruptive. And it's another great example of moving from very basic research into disruptive technology. But there's more here. And there's more that's actually quite surprising. It turns out that this idea of program verification can be run essentially in reverse. And so while we have this program verification idea, we can also run program verification in reverse. And when we do that, that is the problem of program synthesis that Rick Resch had alluded to this morning. And so program synthesis, roughly speaking, is the problem of taking some example inputs and outputs and then asking the question or answering the question, does a program exist that produces those inputs and outputs? Or can we generate all possible programs that are consistent with uh, the example input and outputs? And if we can, can we then generate the code or all the codes uh, that are consistent with that input output? And this is the problem of program synthesis. And so the key insight here and the key surprise is that, in fact, it is possible to take program verification technology, which goes typically in one direction, like this, and in a flash of insight, run it in reverse in order to take example input outputs and generate programs automatically. And so this morning at Rick's keynote, uh, Rick showed you a demonstration video of uh, program synthesis in action in uh, our new version of Microsoft Office in Excel. 2013, where just typing in a couple of examples allows Excel to figure out automatically using program synthesis, using program verification in reverse, just on the basis of, in this case, two examples, or one and a half examples, uh, generate some code and automatically produce all of the other results that you want. And so that's already quite surprising. But this is only three stages of the innovation pipeline, where we go from very basic research to the disruption of very large-scale program verification, to an application of program verification in reverse in Excel, what can come next? And what we are seeing now today with the advent of practical program synthesis technology is just huge areas of application possibilities for program synthesis. 
And just to give you a little taste of the kinds of things that we're seeing today, let's think about online education. Now, if you take a course online, um, you'll listen to some lectures, and then you'll be given some uh, quiz problems. And so let's say you're taking a quiz problem in, uh, in algebra or in, uh, in um, uh, calculus. Uh, the problem with online education, if there are thousands of students taking the same online course, they will all see the same problems. And when they all see the same problems, they will very quickly share the answers. And it will be very hard to know if people are really learning the material. But again, surprisingly, using program synthesis technology, we can actually reduce the idea of producing unique new problems into a program synthesis problem. Because it is possible, actually, to cast the generation of unique new calculus problems as a programming language and then ask the question, based on one example problem, can we generate many new sample problems that are different uh, but similar in difficulty? And so this is a technology that we've been developing uh, very uh, aggressively. Uh, and this uh, scales to many different domains of mathematics. Uh, we're even working uh, collaboratively between uh, this technology in program verification and in natural language processing to even have automatic generation of word problems and English problems. And so uh, the future, I think, is really uh, very bright for this idea of program synthesis. And so this idea, again, illustrates the power of this innovation pipeline, going from basic research to disruptive technology development to mission-focused research uh, and now to sustaining research, where we just look for even more ways to exploit uh, the research results that we've generated. And this, again, uh, helps to populate the whole space of the four quadrants uh, in our investment map for research. And so it's amazing to me that we can go from program verification to spreadsheets to online textbooks. Over and over again, we see basic research in computing producing surprising outcomes. So now let me try to give one last example. Uh, and in this example, it, it, the outcome is perhaps not quite as surprising, but the fact that there's something new that's possible, uh, I think you'll agree, is surprising. And so in this uh, last example, I'm going to talk about coding theory, and in particular, erasure codes. Uh, and since I know that sometimes the terminology and the concepts and principles are taught slightly differently uh, in the US, Europe, and in Asia, uh, let me just give a, a very basic grounding here so that you uh, know what I'm talking about. So let's imagine that we want to have a data store where we're storing two pieces of data in this case, the piece of data A with value 2 and the piece of data B with value 3. So now we can worry about how reliable is our data store? And in particular, if we were to store data value A on one disk and data value B on a second disk, what would happen if one of the disks failed? And so in that case, we would lose data. And so how can we avoid or make very unlikely the loss of data? Now, of course, a very simple idea, and this is the idea of just backups, is to use replication. We can just replicate, uh, in this case, uh, uh, have a single backup copy for each of our data uh, copies. So we'll have a backup copy of A and a backup copy of B. And so in that situation, if one of our data stores should go bad, uh, we still can extract the value of A from our backup. And of course, while this is a very simple idea, it's also quite expensive in terms of the storage overhead. In fact, we've doubled the amount of storage uh, we need uh, for, for this data. So that's not too good. On the other hand, it's not all bad, because while the storage overhead is a factor of two, the, what's called the reconstruction overhead, the cost of extracting our data in case of a failure, uh, is very low. In fact, it's no higher in this case uh, than, than the original. Now, in order to improve this, uh, of course, there's quite a bit of work in uh, coding theory, and in particular, in erasure codes. Uh, and I think many of you have probably studied this in uh, your own um, uh, investigations into computer science. But let me just give a very quick example of erasure coding, where if we want to store A and B, 
uh, but with higher reliability, uh, we can also then have a third data store that has a code, in this case the code being A plus B equals 5. And in this situation, if we were, say, to lose our first uh, copy of A, well, it's OK because by reading B and reading our erasure code, we're able to reconstruct the fact that A is equal to 2. And so we still have our ability to do reconstruction. And we're able to do that with much lower, in fact, half the storage overhead of the simple replication approach, although uh, it, we have double the cost of reconstruction because we have to access two pieces of data to do reconstruction and do a little bit of computation. And so these are kind of the trade-offs. And many of you, I know, have studied Reed-Solomon codes uh, and understand the principles here uh, uh, quite well. Now, um, talking about Reed-Solomon codes, uh, Reed-Solomon codes have been around for more than 50 years. Um, and the so-called conventional Reed-Solomon 6.3 codes, uh, in fact, are uh, quite practical and used extensively by Google. And so here, uh, you can see that uh, we have uh, some uh, spreading of the data that we're storing uh, over uh, six stores, uh, plus having uh, three uh, additional stores uh, to support reconstruction. And so we have essentially a 50% overhead uh, for um, our reliable store. Now we can ask the question, can we do better? And of course, over the past 50 or 60 years, people have worked very hard to understand erasure codes and to really investigate uh, whether we can do better. And there are, of course, refinements of Reed-Solomon codes. Um, one is uh, a 12.4 code. Um, and this is similar to what's used by Facebook. And this, of course, has only 33% overhead. Um, on the other hand, if we do have a failure, for example, in, in uh, data store D0, uh, then we have a very large number of uh, reads in order to reconstruct the code. And so the network traffic and the read traffic that we have during reconstruction can be quite expensive. And so we have this trade-off in erasure codes between, again, between storage overhead and reconstruction uh, costs. Now, the surprising thing here is that while this idea has been studied for more than 50 years, you would think after 50 years that everything possible that can be known about erasure codes has already been discovered. And if I could just refer back to John Hopcroft's lecture this morning, which I found really quite inspirational, if there's any one lesson that I would like you to take out of his lecture, it is that it is never the case that we know everything. And even in something as direct as erasure codes, as, uh, as recently as March of this year, in, even in this kind of well-trodden area, new breakthroughs are being made. And I'm very proud to say that, in fact, in Microsoft research, involving researchers uh, in product teams, in, uh, re and as well as in Redmond and in the Silicon Valley, new erasure coding techniques, in this case called local reconstruction codes, were developed that allow you to tune the availability of storage for much lower storage overhead and much lower reconstruction cost. And in fact, this was uh, in March at the uh, USENIX Technical Symposium, uh, the best paper uh, of that conference. Now, this matters a lot. In fact, theory matters a lot. Because we are seeing today uh, very significant growth, 60% year-on-year file-based storage growth. And so the costs for maintaining cloud services with high availability ends up being very expensive and growing rapidly. And on top of that, as that storage growth happens in the data centers, the number of machines starts to expand, and the mean time to failure starts to, to plummet. And so being able to cope in a cost-efficient way with this kind of growth is something that's very important. And so uh, in the paper, if you're very interested, uh, on erasure coding Windows Azure storage, uh, we showed how local reconstruction codes can do much better. And I would like to point out that uh, Jin Lee, who is uh, one of the leaders of this effort, is also here. Uh, and 
Fortunately for him, unlike with Alex Acero's paper, this paper was not rejected. Uh, it was accepted and, uh, and actually given the best paper. So uh, sometimes uh, the scientific community gets it right. Um, so what are the consequences of this? Well, the consequences are uh, in this graph, we see a graph comparing storage overhead on the x-axis with reconstruction cost in the case of failure on the y-axis. And the red line is the line that we've been living on for several decades using Reed Solomon codes. And now our new technique of local reconstruction costs is shown in the blue. And just to give a few examples of, of, of where uh, the industry is in this space, uh, we see uh, the points on the storage overhead versus reconstruction cost trade-off uh, for Google and Facebook. And for us, in Windows Azure, uh, we now have a tunable system. And in fact, when we operate our cloud systems, we can tune according to our own internal uh, cost calculations. And when we deliver this technology on-premise to customers, uh, they can also choose. And so it's possible, for example, to have a 12 plus 4 plus 2 local reconstruction uh, code that has very rapid uh, and low-cost reconstruction at, uh, at storage overhead that's similar to uh, classic Reed Solomon. Or if you want to have much lower storage overhead, uh, you can do that while maintaining a reconstruction cost that's on par uh, with classic Reed Solomon. And so this ends up actually, for us in Windows Azure, producing savings that are in the hundreds of millions of dollars in operating costs every year. And so again, another wonderful example of surprise where such a well-trodden part of computer science theory, something that theoreticians have been pounding on literally for 50 years, uh, suddenly uh, can have new possibilities. And those new possibilities leading to new disruptions and new mission-focused opportunities uh, in, in this case, in the cloud. All right. And so let me uh, just uh, make uh, some concluding remarks. Uh, I talked a lot about the innovation pipeline. And this innovation pipeline is really depicted in these four quadrants of research. For all of you as new researchers, new people in the computing field, embrace this diversity. Whether your heart is in mission-focused research or in blue sky explorations, or in trying to do something surprising and first in the disruptive quadrant, or whether you're just trying to build a better mousetrap and just make something better and better and keep sustaining uh, the world's capabilities, all of that ends up being necessary. And if you see this as a pipeline, you can see that we, in fact, need computer science researchers that are doing very good and important research in all four of these quadrants. And so, to conclude, let me say that uh, computing research has blue sky, disruptive, mission-focused, sustaining possibilities. And my wish for all of you is that you will embrace this diversity and help all of us as a field create a pipeline to new innovations. Thank you very much.